welcome to the University of Southern California and its Department of Public Safety. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity, and I will be as brief as I can, uh, a day like this that symbolizes so much for our profession, first responders, to not say a few words about why we're here and uh, the incident of 9-11. So as we gather here today, uh, two days away from what will be the 15th anniversary of one of the most tragic dates in American history. Any words that I say in expressing the enormous amount of honor and gratitude that comes with being uh, with us having one of the few monuments in the city of LA that is reflective and a part of the World Trade Center, it is uh, truly a blessing for us to have a monument uh, here on this campus and in this city reflective of uh, the actions and the incident that occurred that day. Uh, and despite this memento being a reminder of one of these, the most tragic days in American history, it also stands here on this campus as a reminder and a tribute to the 2,966 American lives that were lost that day but it also stands as a symbol of recognition to the valiant and brave lives that were sacrificed by the over 400 first responders uh, through whose efforts many, many lives were saved that day. So we, the USC, City of Los Angeles, and those of us that serve this campus community, it's Department of Public Safety, USC Fire and Safety, uh, LAFD, Bureau 13 and Station 15 and LAPD Southwest Division as first responders to this community, we all owe a debt of thanks and gratitude to uh, Jennifer Massey, who you will see and hear from later, who is responsible for getting us this monument uh, from the World Trade Center through the uh, Family Associations and Fire Department of in New York City. So let's give her a round of applause. And also to Dean Sony, the USC Director of uh, Religious Life, uh, for also playing a role in getting us uh, this wonderful monument. So as representatives of this noble profession of first responders, uh, again, I'm privileged to be in law enforcement as a part of the American law enforcement and first responder family. It is my hope that just as on that fateful day, uh, when the beginning at 8.46 a.m., September 11, 2001, when the first plane was flown into the North Tower and those first responders headed into danger with little regard for their own personal safety, only with the knowledge that people needed to be, be saved and that they knew that that was what they were sworn to do. And also with the full realization that the likelihood of them returning to their families was very, very slim, but they made that sacrifice and they ran, ran toward danger anyway. So we should let this act as a reminder to those of us in this community of the sacrifices that were made that day and of the commitment of your first responders and our duty to this community to live up to those very same ideals. And that also, that at this time in our nation's history, that the virtues of patriotism, unity that were displayed in the aftermath of 9-11, that we are reminded that we have so much more in common as Americans that bind us together in what Martin Luther King Jr. called that inescapable single garment of destiny than the things that divide us. So to the nearly 3,000 innocent lives that were lost that day, to the 343 firefighters, from the Fire Department of New York City, the 23 New York police officers, the 37 Port Authority officers, the 15 EMTs, the three court officers, and to the more than 2,000 first responders that were injured and that continue to this day to bear the physical and psychological scars of the, in of the, of the incident that occurred that day, that we, in the indomitable American and Trojan spirit, never forget their sacrifices, 
and that this memorial and this 15th anniversary recognition stand as a constant reminder to us for generations to come. Uh, and with that, I say thank you. And now I would ask that you please stand for the presentation of the colors and the national anthem. Left turn, punch. Detail, hold. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here at this uh, special ceremony commemorating the 15th year anniversary of 9-11. I'm so grateful to everyone who made this occasion possible, and I'm especially thankful for the leadership of my friends and colleagues, Dean Jack Knott and Chief John Thomas, not only for their presence and for their words today, but also for their tireless and enduring support of our ROTC and veteran students and our law enforcement officers right here on campus. And it also gives me great joy to welcome back Jennifer Massey, who, as you heard, spearheaded the initiative to create this 9-11 memorial on campus when she was an undergraduate student here a few years ago. It's hard to believe that our first year students probably don't remember 9-11, even though they have grown up in its shadow and witnessed firsthand the geopolitical fault lines of a post 9-11 world. For those of us who did live through 9-11, our lives dramatically changed during that dark and tragic time. And I believe I speak for all of us here when I say that we will all carry those powerful images and overwhelming emotions with us throughout our lives. Indeed, we will never forget. Today, we gather as a university community to remember the thousands of innocent victims who died in the horrific attacks 15 years ago in rural Pennsylvania, in Washington, DC, and in New York City. Today, we pay tribute to the first responders, the firefighters, police officers, and medics who were killed in the courageous and selfless service of others. Today, we honor the heroes of United Flight 93, who sacrificed their own lives for the security and well-being of our country. And today, we pray for those who lost their loved ones on 9-11, the parents, siblings, children, spouses, partners, and friends who have suffered immeasurably since then. At this time, I now ask that everyone rise as they are able in body and spirit and join me to observe a moment of silence as we honor the memory of those we lost on 9-11. 9-11 was an American tragedy and also a global tragedy. More than 90 countries were represented in the deaths at the World Trade Center. And in the 15 years since 9-11, other nations have also been victimized by devastating terrorist attacks. France and Belgium, Norway and Spain, England and Indonesia, Iraq and Turkey, Nigeria and Egypt, India and Pakistan, and so many others. So today we mourn together as a global Trojan family a family that represents virtually every state in our country, every nation in our world, and every religion on our planet. As we remember September 11th, 2001, let us also take a moment to revisit September 11th, 1893. 
It was on that day that India's most prominent spiritual teacher, Swami Vivekananda, addressed a rapturous aud audience at the Parliament of the World's Religions in Chicago. His now famous speech was a prescient warning about the dangers of extremism and conflict that would manifest on the same date 108 years later. On that day, he said, quote, sectarianism, bigotry, and its horrible descendant, fanaticism, have long possessed this beautiful earth. They have filled the earth with violence, drenched it often and often with human blood, destroyed civilization, and sent whole nations to despair. Had it not been for these horrible demons, human society would be far more advanced than it is now. But their time has come, and I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honor of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the pen, and of all uncharitable feelings between persons wending their way to the same goal. Let us take to heart Swami Vivekananda's profound words and affirm that this moment of remembrance is also a call for action, engagement, and reconciliation. Let us acknowledge that our university community is an inspiring example of how the world can work together creatively and collabor collaboratively and compassionately across disciplines and domains and departments in order to achieve our common goals and our shared aspirations. Let us realize that our faith traditions should be part of the solution to the world's great crises and not part of the problem. And let us all say together, amen. It is now my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Jack Knott, who's on my friend John Thomas's diploma. Please join me in welcoming Jack Knott. Well, thank you very much, Chief Thomas and Dean Sony, and good morning, everyone. I welcome you on behalf of the Sol Price School of Public Policy. Fifteen years ago, our nation changed forever with the terror attacks of 9-11. For the first time, global terrorism hit American soil, and we witnessed the loss of thousands of lives. The effects reverberate through our society still today. Grief, loss, as well as physical and mental health challenges continue to impact survivors, all the responders, and the families of everyone touched by this tragedy. But it also dramatically changed U.S. national security policies. The federal government declared a war on terror that discontinued the national security doctrine of containment and deterrence of our enemies that was adopted and very successful since the end of World War II. The Bush administration initiated a new strategy of regime change, and if you are not for us, you are against us. These changes served as the rationale for two large and protracted scale wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as numerous smaller violent conflicts around the world. The war on terror also ushered in much harsher versions of interrogation with waterboarding techniques on captured combatants, and it led to a massive increase in the national surveillance of citizens. The federal government established the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, considered the most significant transformation in government organization in more than half a century, and we've all experienced the increased security at airports and elsewhere. And directly or indirectly, we are affected by the enormous economic costs of fighting and responding to acts of terror. Although difficult to measure, many economists peg these costs in the trillions of dollars. Unfortunately, as has been mentioned, the United States is not alone. 9-11 was but one of hundreds of terrorist attacks across the globe that have killed and maimed thousands and thousands of people since then. From the San Bernardino and Paris shootings in 2015 to the 2016 bombings in Brussels and the ongoing attacks in the Islamic State in Syria and Africa and elsewhere, people far and wide are exposed to the reality of extremism. In 2016, it is estimated that there have been 1,213 terrorist attacks and 10,459 people killed worldwide from these attacks. Two recent incidents in the Los Angeles International Airport underscore the heightened awareness of terror and the fear and panic that it can cause right here at home. As the late Boutros Boutros Ghali, former Secretary General of the United Nations said 20 years ago, 
As a global threat, only global action can eradicate the evil of terrorism. The cooperative action of all is required to eradicate this threat to all nations. At USC uh, and the Price School, we are doing our small part to help fight against the continued violence of terrorism. Our Create Homeland Security Center, and I notice that uh, our director, uh, Detlof von Winterfeld, is here joining us today, which is a center joint with the Viterbi School of Engineering since 2004 has conducted research and fostered dialogue among leaders across all sectors. It has strengthened our knowledge base in assessing consequences of terrorist events, gauging their economic imp in impacts, and evaluating the effectiveness of counterterrorism measures. And it has created valuable tools used today in the field by counterterrorism personnel at all levels. The USC Price School Safe Community Institute, and I see our director at Frank Quambo is here as well, SCI, studies the roots of radicalization to help citizens and law enforcement at home and abroad identify risks and, ask, and act before threats become a reality. SCI recently engaged a delegation of public officials and community leaders to discuss building community resilience against radicalization and extremism. And through the U.S. State Department, SCI hosted a delegation from 11 European countries to share research and exchange ide ideas for countering violent extremism. Terrorism eats away at our trust in others and our sense of safety and community. It underlies some aspects of our anti-religious and anti-immigrant sentiments, especially against Muslims. But as Dr. Errol Southers, the Director of Homeland Violent Extremism Studies at SCI emphasizes, and I see Errol is here as well, it is important to widen our understanding of the scope of terrorism beyond religious beliefs and beyond foreign borders. As Dr. Southers has written, for many, violent extremism has become synonymous with Islamic radicalism, but this is woefully myopic view. Religious belief is only one example of a legitimizing ideology that can contribute to violent activity. Anti-terrorism, and especially the declared war on terror, have led to surveillance, security, and military tactics that potentially challenge our nation's values of openness, liberty, and freedom. So to me, one important way of honoring those who died in 9-11 and, and in those terrible attacks is to assure that in the midst of our concerted and vigilant efforts to prevent further attacks, we also preserve our values and way of life that so many of us have sacrificed and fought for over several generations. We also want to commit to be resolute and resilient and remember how we all came together as one nation to support recovery efforts and encourage healing. We must hold on to this sense of being one community, especially in a political climate as explosive and divisive and acrimonious as the one we are in the midst of today. 9-11 reminds us to set aside our differences in favor of rational thought and discussion that brings us to a common ground we reached after that terrible day, a place where ideology takes a back seat to inclusion and respect for those who need our help and understanding. No matter the color of their skin, or their religious beliefs, or their gender, or what neighborhood they live in. As we, uh, around the country, lay wreaths and hold ceremonies to remember those who suffered and died on 9-11, let us remember that as a human race, we all share each other's sorrows and our, each other's hopes. And together, as a nation and as a world, we must not let terrorism defeat us nor alter our commitment to the values we hold dear of inclusion, social justice, freedom, and liberty. So I thank you, each one of you, and every one of you, for joining us on this very special day. Thank you. Many Americans will never forget where they were when they heard about the attacks. I was supposed to be at the World Trade Center subway stop at 9 a.m., but as usual, was running late. While rushing to get ready, I turned on the television just in time to see the second tower being hit. After that, I knew I wasn't going anywhere. 
Being tardy was extremely lucky for me that September morning, and my personal story pales in comparison to many others. I spent the rest of the morning standing in a payphone line with at least 50 other people because all the cell phones weren't working. We all had the same goal in mind, which was to reach loved ones to tell them we were alive. We stood in eerie silence as I thought about what we had all witnessed. The Twin Towers had crumbled before our eyes, and whether we realized it or not, life as we knew it was transformed forever. The attacks of September 11th reshaped the face of the nation, the course of history, the, our lives and the lives of those to come, not just here in California or New York or the United States, but around the globe. In the years that followed, living in Los Angeles and being on campus, I couldn't help but feel a sense of detachment from 9-11 from was occurring. I didn't want the memory of this horrendous attack to fade into history like some long ago far away event. I began having discussions with other students here at USC and discovered that the events of 9-11 were very real and important to them as well. Armed with the knowledge of the universal importance of 9-11, I asked the university if we could have a memorial on campus. There are several individuals, amazing individuals, without whom none of this would have been possible. Lee Ielpi was the founder of the September 11th Families Association, and he enabled USC to attain a piece of steel from the South Tower. He was a firefighter for over 50 years, and he lost his son, Jonathan Ielpi, that fateful day. He urged me to write a letter to the fire commissioner of the New York City Fire Department, Salvatore J. Cassano, requesting a piece of the World Trade Center steel. Dr. Varun Soni comprised the letter on behalf of USC, officially meeting the specific requirements so we could be granted this opportunity and enabled us to house this 9-11 artifact, which first responders recovered. Um, Chief Thomas graciously allowed us to place it in front of his Department of Public Safety. Each September 11th, we pay tribute to those who lost lives that fateful day. We gather in unity to honor the freedoms that our citizens died for and continue to fight for today. Remembering that day is not a choice, but our solemn obligation. I try to remember the spirit of that day, the day that Americans came together to show the world what makes us a great nation. You know, continuing to show artifacts and images of 9-11 is, is a very controversial topic. To paraphrase President Kennedy, we do it not because it is easy, but, but, it's, but because it is hard. And I believe we need a constant reminder of that horrendous day. Generations of USC students will have the privilege of having this piece of history on campus for hundreds of years. And I hope that in hundreds of years, Americans remember this day. Today is a day to remember the heroes of that day, the lives and the loved ones lost, and to know that every day we live on, being Americans, we have already defeated evil and hate. Will you please rise for the playing of taps? This concludes our ceremony. We will. This is the this is the wreath that will maintain um, its place through this weekend. Uh, the official date is Sunday, but uh, in recognition and honor, uh, this is about ensuring that uh, there is 
a continual and thank you Jennifer uh, and thank you everyone that was involved in ensuring that USC uh, has this piece of history uh, for generations to come and not only that USC but the city of Los Angeles uh, has this piece of history in a, in a place that we can all come to and gather and remember why America is great. America is great because we withstand adversity, we withstand uh, attacks, and it binds us closer together in unity, in service, commitment, and in our vigilance to ensure that we are that beacon of light for all of humanity for generations to come that is reflective in the best that we can be and the best that um, our service lends itself to in honor and recognition of those uh, that made our freedoms possible. So with that, uh, this concludes our ceremony and thank you all for coming.